Welcome to the Fed Life Podcast with Dan Seip from Serving Those Who Serve. In this podcast, Dan draws from years of financial experience to help federal employees overcome challenges that every Fed can relate to. Join us for this journey as we reach, teach, and serve to help you make the right financial decisions. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome. This episode of the FedLight Podcast, I am your host, Dan Seip. Additionally, I'm the branch manager here at Serving Those Who Serve and Lee Seip and Associates. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen, and I want to thank you for your service. As I've said many times, you do not hear that enough. We are back again today with the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Ed Zerndorfer, as part of our ongoing mission to reach, teach, and serve you, the career feds. At the outset, I need to say the opinions of our guest, Ed Zerndorfer, are not the opinions of Raymond James or serving those who serve. This podcast is presented for information only and is not intended to be taken as advice. All listeners should consult their personal advisors before taking any action, although I do think Ed is awesome and his thoughts are great. Ed, welcome back. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for having me back. Today, we're on a follow-up that we promised to do in the last podcast to take a deeper dive into health savings accounts. Now, Ed, once again, you've written on this in the Fed Zone, so people can find that at blog, B-L-O-G, dot S-T-W-Serve, dot com. So, Ed, what is a health savings account or HSA? A health savings account or HSA, Dan, is a tax preferential account in which individuals get tax benefits for contributing to this account And if used to pay for qualified medical, dental, vision expenses, the money withdrawn is not going to be taxed. So you're getting benefits both on the front end and on the back end. Okay, well, let's hold on for a second because, you know, we're both money guys here. You're a tax guy and and I'm I'm the other side. So it can go in tax deductible and then come out not taxed. That's correct, Dan. And the best way to, to describe this is... To give you something very similar, and that is our good friend, the Individual Retirement Arrangement, or IRA. A Mm -hmm. lot of people are familiar with IRAs, and there are different types of IRAs. The first type of IRA that was available back in 1974 was called a tax traditional IRA in which the contributions were tax deductible. Yep. They're still around, but there are only a certain number of people who can make those tax deductible contributions. Not going to get into the details. But with a tax-deductible traditional IRA, the contributions that you make are deductible in the sense that they are adjustments to your income. Got it. The money goes into the traditional IRA, gets earnings, interest, dividends, whatever, Mm -hmm. and then one will pay tax when the IRA proceeds are withdrawn. Right. Usually in retirement. Yeah, because his uncle's waiting. Okay. Uh, He gave you the breakdown. He's waiting to collect. So you're getting essentially tax-deferred growth. Got it. The other type of IRA that's more recent, came out in 1998, was is the Roth IRA, which, mm-hmm. of course, are still around. With the Roth IRA, you're getting no tax benefits when you contribute. The contributions are not tax-deductible. However, the earnings that you get and the withdrawals that you make from this Roth IRA are going to be tax-free, assuming certain conditions are sure. met. So the HSA essentially combines both the traditional IRA and the Roth IRA in which the contributions are dedu- are deductible or adjustments to income and the earnings, the contributions and earnings grow tax deferred and when withdrawn are not going to be taxed provided mm-hmm. it's used to pay for qualified expenses. And, and that's typically medical, correct? Medical, dental, vision, long-term care expenses. And well, I don't know about you, and and folks, you may have you may have seen pictures of us, you may not have. Let's just say Ed and I aren't twenty years old. So speaking for team not twenty years old, I've noticed that I've gotten more medical expenses as I've gotten older. So I don't think our listeners are going to have a tough time finding ways to take it out. Absolutely, Dan. But we, I just want to take one step forward here is now it's open season now for federal mm-hmm. employees. And you're looking for a health insurance plan. Sure. Makes some difference if you're a 22-year-old employee or you could be 42, it could be 62, 72. You're trying to find a health insurance plan that's going to pay for 
most of your expenses. If sure. you're looking for a plan that's paying for everything, those days are long gone. Sure. You can't concentrate on premiums here, which you have to accept the fact that you're going to have out-of-pocket expenses, mm -hmm. including deductibles, co-payments, co-insurance. Sure. The question is, what is the best way to pay for those increasing out-of-pocket expenses? Mm -hmm. And an HSA is one way to do it because that's what the that's what the money is there for in the account to be pulled out tax-free to pay for any out-of-pocket expenses. Sure. And couldn't agree with you more. Here at Serving Those to Serve, we feel this is a massively overlooked planning tool, especially for feds for work, life, and retirement. We'll touch on that a little bit more in the podcast. Let's jump into the nuts and bolts. The account that I set up, is that my property or does that, is that owned by the health plan? When you set up an HSA, it is your account okay. that follows you the rest of your life. Now, that's different hmm. than the other type of, health, of tax preferred health account, which we'll talk about later. It's mm -hmm. called a health care flexible spending account, mm -hmm. which you're going to lose when you leave federal service. Gotcha. Uh, or when you retire. The HSA, on the hand, is your account that's going to follow you the rest of your life, just like an IRA, whether traditional or Roth. And also, the HSA can be used for out-of-pocket medical, dental, vision expenses after you retire. Well, that's great. You could have, you, your HSA follows you the rest of your life. And see, that's a key provision for that life cycle and retirement planning. Now, Ed, you, you mentioned in your article that one thing I do need to have is a high-deductible health plan, HDHP. Can you walk us through that and what it means? Yes, Dan. Every year, the IRS sets the definition of what a high-deductible health insurance plan is. Mm -hmm. They set the minimum amounts of deductible, whether you have self-only coverage or self and family. For 2020, the limits were set, and in order to enroll in a high-deductible health insurance plan, that plan has to have a, if you self, have self-only coverage, has to have a minimum deductible of $3,000. Five hundred and fifty dollars. Mm -hmm. Three thousand five hundred fifty dollars. And if you have self, and I'm sorry, family, self plus uh, one. Let's see, self. Let's see, self and family. I made a mistake. It's actually fourteen hundred dollars. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm getting things mixed up here. Even so, better for you, singles. Okay, singles, self only coverage, fourteen hundred dollars for self and family, twenty eight hundred dollars. That's the minimum deductible the plan would have to have for self and family or self plus one coverage. Now, gotcha. And, and folks, those of you who are listening, I need to tell you something. You know, Ed just got done teaching for eight straight hours here at the SWS headquarters. We had a great group of feds downstairs, and he's right in here. He's he's the hardest working man in helping feds that, that you'll ever find. It is so rare for him not to have the number nailed, but see how quickly he, uh, he grabbed them. So... And our feds can find those within FEHB, right? Because your Fed Notes Zone article has a list of that. And our, our big local ones are Blue Cross Blue Shield and United Health? That's correct. Here locally, the Blue Cross Blue Shield and United Healthcare offer, and the key, the, there are four letters you have to look for H D H P, High Deductible Health Plan, and they're listed under Blue Cross Blue Shield and United Healthcare. Just what we need in, in the federal space, one more acronym. And again, folks, if you're listening to this on the Metro or in your car, don't worry. Go to blog.scwserve.com. Ed's full article is there, including with live links for some of the things he's talking about. Now, one thing, because uh, I read Ed's stuff, I can't be in Medicare and do this one, right? There are certain plans that if you're enrolled in or certain status situations that you could not enroll in a high deductible health insurance plan and have an HSA. Gotcha. One of which is being enrolled in Medicare. Okay. And that's any part of Medicare, whether it's Part A, Part B, Part C, Part D. Mm -hmm. I say that because some federal employees work past 65. Sure. And they do, and they enroll in Medicare A. Why? Because Medicare Part A is free. There's free. no monthly premium. So they decide, what the heck, since I'm over 65 and it's free, I'll enroll in Medicare Part A. Well, they won't, don't want to do that if they want to participate in a, in, in a they want to contribute to an HSA. Okay. I want to emphasize, Dan, what we're talking about here, if somebody has an HSA before they're 65 mm -hmm. and they're contributing to it because they're enrolled in a high deal health insurance plan, mm -hmm. they, they'll keep that HSA. But if they enroll in Medicare uh... Part A... They cannot contribute any further to the HSA once they have enrolled in Medicare. Gotcha. Another category of employees that um, cannot enroll in a high deductible health insurance plan and have an HSA are those employees who are dependents. 
dependence okay. of somebody else. Ah, I okay. ran across a federal employee who um, who was um, who was under his his parents' plan. He's 24 years old, mm -hmm. and he told me, "Why should he enroll in, in self <laughs> insurance? I'll stay on mom and dad's plan." Okay, bank That's of mom okay. and dad, the bank that bank of bank of dad and mom. Yep. I said, "Well, that individual." If they stay as uh, under their under the parents' plan, would certainly not be able to enroll in a high deductible health insurance plan and have an HSA. Even if they even if they want to stay as depend a a tax dependent gotcha. uh, of a, of a mom and dad. So, what goes into setting up the account? I'm assuming there's an intermediary. When you enroll in a high deductible health insurance plan, let's say because now it's open season. Sure. Your uh, say it's Blue Cross Blue Shield, United mm -hmm. Healthcare, or I know GEHA has one. It's a nationwide mm -hmm. plan. The plan will tell you this is your HR HSA custodian oh, okay. that is in charge. However, Dan, you're not restricted to that custodian. Really? You could you could transfer your HSA custodian to a company like Vanguard or Fidelity. Oh, okay. They have uh, they have um, they manage HSAs too. And the reason somebody may want to do that is because. Remember that the HSA is gaining earnings, right. interest, dividends is being invested. So you may feel that if you have the HSA invested in a more aggressive stock fund, something like mm -hmm. that, you'll do better than having it in a simple bank account. Mm -hmm. So you could, you have the option of transferring your HSA custodian to another to, to someone else. So you're not restricted to what the plan tells you to. Okay, folks, good thing to take up with your advisor. If your advisor goes, huh, uh, check out stwserve.com. So, and I, I have to ask this one because I'm, I'm, I'm not a young man anymore. If I have this, I know I can hang on to it when I leave service. Uh, what happens when I leave the earth? What happens when I pass away? Okay. Well, one of the things you're going to do with your HSA, Dan, is name a beneficiary. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, Dan, I'm sure your beneficiary is going to be your spouse. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, upon, God, forbid, God forbid, upon your death, your spouse, your wife, will be able to... Uh, may keep the HSA, 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 and if she happens to be also to, to, make, to stay in this high deductible health insurance plan, not enrolled in Medicare, your spouse can continue to contribute to the HSA. Oh, that's great. Okay, and then use the money, use withdrawals to pay for 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 their for their out of pocket medical, dental, vision expenses. Oh, that's excellent. But upon let's say your spouse's death, then who would inherit it? Let's say your children. Mm -hmm. Can your children can, can, uh, can continue using it? No. They have to withdraw the money, okay. pay federal and state tax on okay. the amount of money taken out, but hey, no they penalty. they get free money, Ed. They can pay a little tax. But no, no, no penalty. There's no penalty. There's, there are penalties for taking money out of the HSA and not used for qualified gotcha. expenses. Okay. So, actually, that's a great segue because you already touched on, you know, deductibles and out-of-pocket limits. And, folks, seriously, on his article in the Fed Zone, he's got – that whole list blocked out for you there, so you don't have to scribble those down right now. But let's talk a little bit about the IRS regulation, the penalties if you don't follow the rules. What uh, what might people run into there? Here here is the main penalty: if you pull the money out of the HSA and pay, and pay for something that's not qualified, a qualified medical expenses, mm -hmm. dental, vision, or long term care expenses, uh -huh. let's say, and you're under sixty five, you will pay federal, state tax, and a twenty percent penalty. For taking money out. Ouch. If you're over 65 and you pull the money out and not use it to pay for qualified medical, dental, vision expenses, then you'll pay federal and state tax, but no penalty. Oh, okay. If you're over 65. Okay. Over well, that's 65. pretty civilized. And uh, as you noted in your article, these can be found in IRS Publication 502. And on the site, that's irs.gov slash pub, P-U-B slash IRS slash uh, dash PDF slash 502 dot PDF. Don't worry about it. Just go to blog.servingstwserve.com, and that's that's in his Fed Zone article. I, and, I, I just like to add something too in terms sure. of the qualified expenses. Many people are not aware of this that one can use their HSA withdrawals to pay for things like long-term care insurance mm. premiums. Normally, that's that's not allowed. For let's say you can't do that with a with a with a healthcare FSA. You can make withdrawals from your HSA after age 65 to pay for Medicare Part B or to be reimbursed for Medicare Part B monthly premiums. Okay. Here you're over 65, you're enrolled in Medicare, you cannot contribute to your HSA because you're enrolled in Medicare, but you still have your HSA, make withdrawals to pay for expenses in retirement, including Medicare Part B. 
I, use, I have to cite the example in the article where somebody at age 25 mm-hmm. contributes $1,700, let's say, a year, sure. putting in half what they're allowed to, mm-hmm. and carrying over from year to year the 1700 And that 1700 is being reinvested at maybe 6% from mm-hmm. year to year. By the time they're 65, they'll have about $265,000 in their HSA account that can be used to pull out to pay for anything that's medical and not pay any tax. That's that's a nice position to be in. One thing we we talked about, if it goes to my wife and then goes to my kids, they pay taxes on it. While we're active and my kids are covered under my health plan, can I use this for their expenses too? Um, if you claim your child as a tax dependent, okay, okay, even even though even though they may have their own insurance, but you're claiming them as a tax dependent. Understand, Dan, that under the new tax law, the current tax law, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2000. And seventeen, there are no tax dependents. You don't get any. You don't get any four thousand dollar write off for each exemption. Right. However, the IRS has maintained a definition of what a tax dependent is. And okay. if you can legitimately claim somebody as a tax dependent because you provide more than half of their support, and they have income that's less than a certain amount, then you would be able to use your HSA to pay for their out of pocket expenses. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking with college tuition and room and board, I'm covering a check there, so I feel pretty good about no that. No problem. And in your article, you, you had some really great information going into some of the details about a high deductible health plan. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? Because I, I think for some people, the name is going to sound intimidating and they might not dig it any further. So why don't you talk about what, what makes it that besides the, the IRS code? Well, a high deductible health insurance plans have that certain minimum deductible. We said fourteen hundred self only, twenty eight hundred mm-hmm. family, and what that means in plain English is that if you go to a doctor and you're and you're being treated and there's a cost for the visit, visit is not going to be covered by your insurance plan until you've reached that deductible. Mm-hmm. People get scared about that. Oh, what happens when I go to the? I got to pay that the do- five hundred dollars to the doctor. Well, you can take it out of your HSA. But I want to point out that under the Affordable Care Act, which were un, which has been the law of the land since 2010, mm-hmm. your insurance plan, your health, your federal employees' health insurance plan, must cover what's called well visits mm-hmm. at first dollar coverage. And what first dollar coverage means is you do not have to meet your deductible in order to have your 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 well visits covered. By your insurance plan. They must cover it from day one. So your annual physical, for example? So your annual physical. If you are in a stop smoking clinic, um, you're going to have a colonoscopy. You're going to have something like... Uh, you uh, had me a, on the first two, Ed. Uh, a, mam- a mammogram, <laughs> a mammogram, something like that for women, things like that. Gotcha. They're going to be f- covered at first dollar coverage without re- reaching that de- at that deductible. Okay. And I saw something in your article where it mentioned sort of a... It's called a premium pass-through the, that's in some of those plans. Yes, um, we didn't talk about the con- what you can c- actually yourself can contribute to the to the HSA in mm-hmm. 2020. One can contribute to his or her HSA self self three thousand five hundred and fifty dollars three five five zero self plus one self and family seventy one hundred dollars. That's the maximum contribution you can make to the HSA. Now, under the federal employees' health insurance plans, those people enrolled in high deductible plans. You will pay a little extra in premiums for your plan, but a part of your premium is automatically put into your HSA. Gotcha. It's called premium pass through. Mm-hmm. And I think in my column, I gave you the uh, I gave the uh, a link. W- you did. What, what what the premium pass throughs are for the year 2019 are not up yet for 2020. It shows, but that that amount that's being that's being put into the HSA from part of, from your premium is not going to be the full amount that you can contribute. You yourself can make a contribution to your HSA up to the annual limits, 3550 7100 mm-hmm. and those contributions that you make are considered to be an adjustment to income. That's going to save you in federal and most places state income taxes. It's nice. an adjustment to income with no individual income limitations. Anybody can make that contribution. See, that's different than the IRA because the individual sure. traditional IRAs and Roth IRAs have income limits as far as when you can contribute. Not the case with the HSA. Mm-hmm. So you're getting tax benefits on the front end. And also I want to point out with this with these contributions to the HSA, you yourself do not have to make that make that limit. If you have a relative who wants to give you a gift and that's the girl says 
uh, here's a thousand dollars. Wow. Give you, here's, your, here's your anniversary gift, your birthday gift. If they put it into the HSA, it's going to count for you. You, oh, do, you yourself do not have to put the money money in. Huh. Okay, somebody can do it. In. And one of the one of the way you can fund your HSA, IRS allows you to make a one time transfer of part of your traditional IRA. If you have a traditional IRA that say was has not been con, uh, funded for years, and you want to do something with it, well, you can, can you could take your uh, your IRA, your traditional IRA, and transfer it into your HSA up to the annual limit. And this is only sure. a one-time transfer you're allowed to do. Okay. Okay? But that will not be tax deductible. It's just a transfer. It's going. It's, it's like a, a transfer of one gotcha. IRA to another. Okay. And, you know, just to put a pin on something you talked about before from the planning side, you know, that, that our feds could put away money pre-tax, that they could transfer the money so it could be invested for a long-term posture. And, you know, let's, let's think about this because... What I see time and time again is, is people saying, well, I wish I had known this when I was younger. So, folks, if you listen to this podcast and there, there are young people that you know, share this podcast with them. Because getting started with this, you know, in your 30s when, let's face it, I, I look back to my 30s and, you know, maybe I twisted my ankle in a softball game. I mean, <laughs> that, was, that was what would happen. So you don't have the big medical expenses. You do have the ability to put this away pre-tax, get a break there, grow it tax-free. And get to a place where you're further down the road, and you are facing medical expenses, and you're able to take care of that, take care of that tax free. As always, folks, talk to your advisor. So, so Ed, how do we enroll? What uh, what goes into that? Well, the open season's here. If you want to get into the federal, this is the open season between now and December 9th. You have to find for yourself a high deductible health insurance plan mm-hmm. that has associated with an HSA, and they're listed in the in my column. I uh, yep. and, and, the, and the link is there. It always gives the links. Okay. And then, then your coverage will take effect the first day of the new leave year, which is January 5th, 2020, at okay. which point you know, your premium pass-through will start, and you can start making contributions to your, to your HSA throughout the year in 2000 and 2020. I do want to point out that the, that the, that the deadline for contributing to your HSA for the for, for for the year 2020 is not December 31st 2020. It is April 15, 2021. Tax deadline time. Oh, wow. So here you're looking at the let's turn up the clock to a year from January. Oh my God, I owe a lot of taxes. Well, but I still have a couple thousand dollars I can put into my HSA. There well, you go. if you're in a 24 percent tax bracket and you put that two thousand dollars into your HSA, 24 percent of two thousand is 480 bucks. Nice. That'll save you 480 if that's federal, and then another whatever state, 8 to 10% for state, sure. you're going to save in state taxes. So it, it, they, you have more flexibility in that sense to put money into the HSA than let's say you do with the traditional, with the traditional TSP. Sure. With your traditional TSP, your deadline for contributing to the traditional TSP is uh, your last pay date in December. Gotcha. Period. Okay. Well, Ed, I, I've worked with you long enough to know. That uh, that you always have some some thoughts that might even be cautionary. So, uh, any closing thoughts for our listeners on this? HSAs are not for everybody. Everybody's circumstances are different. I would encourage families, especially families who have young children, who go to the pediatrician a lot, who have uh, who have uh, star athletes, soccer players, baseball players, football players, who are visiting their doctors more often than not. This may not be for you because you're going to run out of HSA. Your your money is going to be used up pretty quick. But everyone should look at their situation and look and start with this past year to see what you've actually paid out of pocket. See that. Um, that uh, if you can really afford to do this HSA, and if it, it looks good, try it out. The worst is worse. Just for one year, one sure. year, you'll be under the HSA, and it doesn't work out. Next open season, get out of the high deductible health insurance plan. Any money that's in the HSA will stay there, follow you the rest of your life. Maybe later on down the line, you'll be you'll re-enroll in the in the in the, in the uh, high deductible health insurance plan, and then continue fun, funding your HSA. This is not a one decision, once in a life decision. It's going to it's going to be from year to year, identical to what you do with your IRAs and TSB. You just sure. decide how much you want to contribute each year, and uh, according to whatever. Your needs are. Makes sense. Well, Ed, you always bring it strong, and I know the feds appreciate you. I sure do, uh, and how you help them make the best uh, best decisions throughout the year, open season. And, folks, that's a wrap. Uh, Ed and I will be back 
As we continue to work together to reach, teach, and serve you, be sure to tune in for our next one where we're going to cover a cousin here, sort of, healthcare flexible spending accounts and health reimbursement arrangements. You don't want to miss that. We are Serving News to Serve. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast on the YouTube channel. You can also find it on our website, swserve.com. And remember to share it with friends and strangers. I say that all the time. But seriously, we now have regular listeners, Ed. We do. And so right now, if you're listening, think of one of your Fed friends and text them the link. If each one will reach one, we'll be able to help more and more Feds each day. Right, Ed? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So check us out on Twitter and LinkedIn. And don't forget our seminars every month around the DMV featuring the guru, Ed Zerndorfer. Ed Live is an experience you don't want to miss. We now have the Ed Prentices. So he's got some, uh, some folks that are, that are learning his Jedi ways on this. And it's, it's especially fun. Uh, you don't want to miss Ed Live. For more information, go to swserve.com and click Seminars and Events. Read Ed every month in the Fed Zone, two articles a month. We may be bumping that up. Also at blog.swserve.com. So for Ed, the crew at Serving the Serve, and me, Dan Sipe, good luck, Godspeed, and above all, remember, it's your Fed life. Please, please, please make it a great one because you deserve it. We are out. Thank you for listening to the Fed Life Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of serving those who serve or Raymond James. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Securities offered through Raymond James Financial Services Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Raymond James Financial Services Advisors Incorporated. Serving those who serve is not a registered broker or dealer and is independent of Raymond James Financial Services. Raymond James is not affiliated and does not endorse the opinions or services of any of the quoted professionals or their respective firms. Any opinions are those of Dan Sipe and not necessarily those of RJFS or Raymond James. This case study is for illustrative purposes only. Individual cases will vary. Neither Raymond James Financial Services nor any Raymond James Financial Advisor renders advice on tax issues. These matters should be discussed with the appropriate professional. Investing involves risk and you may incur a profit or loss regardless of strategy selected, including diversification and asset allocation. Raymond James is not affiliated with and does not endorse the opinions or services of the quoted professionals or their respective organizations.